So I, I think my presentation will fall into the category of an example right about now might be really helpful. We often hear a lot of theories at conferences like this, uh, a lot of book uh, explorations, uh, a lot of uh, things that can be taught uh, in a classroom. But I'm going to take you through a tangible real world example and then give you the opportunity to ask me questions about what you see. I'm going to start, if a picture is worth a thousand words, perhaps a movie is worth a storybook. So I'm going to start with a video. Most organizations don't really spend much time thinking about their culture. Most organizations operate in chaos. Everyone wants to work on something that's bigger than themselves. I did. I started out in an industry that I was very excited about. Very quickly, I hit a trough of disillusionment. And by 1997, when I was promoted to vice president of product development, I wanted out. I wanted to get as far away from this industry as I could. And then in that moment, I decided to change the industry. And that's the story that I've captured in this book. People are coming from all over the planet to come visit this space that's in the basement of a parking structure in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. And they're coming for a reason. They're coming to see something. What most people are looking for is some lessons around what it takes to build an intentionally joyful culture. Imagine half of my team had joy and the other half didn't. Which half would you want working on your project? We had so many requests for these tours, we realized it was time to share this story with the world in a different way. And that's how the book came to be. space is flexible. We work two to a computer, we assign these pairs, we switch them every five working days. The human energy that results from this kind of organization, you can actually feel the joy when you're in the room. My name is Richard Sheridan and I'm the author of Joy Inc. A little bit of an advertisement for the book but that wasn't my goal with showing you the video. I figured it was important to peek inside the organization, see what it looks like, see what kind of things I want to describe. And I want to take you down a little bit of a personal path here for me as to why I'm the guy standing in front of you talking about joy in the workplace. I'm going to start out trying to interact with you. It's a little bit bright here and I know that uh, everybody's spread all out. But um, imagine you wanted to create your own version of a company that you want to work in like I did. Uh, you could go to conferences, you could read books, you could uh, take classes, you could go see examples, and when you got done, it was exactly the organization you were hoping for. And you could describe it in just one word. Now, my word is joy, but I'm curious what your word might be. What word would you use to describe the resulting organization? Not a rhetorical question. Synergistic. Synergistic. Cool. Cool. I like cool. Fulfilling. Fulfilling. Enthusiastic, fun, challenging. challenging. Maybe profitable fits in there, productive, engaging, all that kind of stuff that works too. Uh, and perhaps if I leave you with nothing else today as I work through this presentation and you reflect on it later, uh, I want to get you back to thinking, as you reflect on what you've learned over the few days you're together here, why? Why are those things important to you? Why is this profession important to you? Why did you pick this profession? For me, I don't know why. I fell in love with computing when I was just a kid. I thought this was going to be one of the coolest professions ever. Uh, I was only 13 years old at the time. It was back in 1971. And I fell in love with computing. I thought software was going to be this amazing blank canvas that you could do anything you want. I think software, the discovery of software, in some ways is probably one of the most important discoveries in the history of mankind. And yet, very quickly, as I launched my career, the joy was gone. There were long nights away from family. There were projects that were canceled. There was the all-nighters. Uh, remember, our industry, the software industry in particular, is one that typically puts the word death march into a business context. 
and we end up destroying relationships, destroying families, jettisoning important time with loved ones so that we can hit that project milestone, and we end up in that world of chaos. The software industry is typically an industry where everybody comes in to work in firefighting costumes. We wear rubber jackets and plastic visors. We carry oxygen tanks on our back, while at the same time practicing the managerial equivalent of pyromania. We're flicking lit cigarette butts everywhere and carrying sloshing gas cans, and we're wondering why it is that there's fires everywhere. And we do it to ourselves. And most of the time, once we operate long enough in that chaos, and I define chaos as the land of never getting anything done. You get a lot of stuff started. There's a lot of activity. There's a lot of energy. There's a lot of uh, commotion. A lot of long days. Time away from families. But one day, the organization wakes up and says, we don't want chaos anymore. We want to get control of this chaos. And they grab this big lever, and they pull it. Organizationally, you pull the lever all the way over to the other side. And you go from chaos to bureaucracy. You go from the land of never getting anything done to the land of never getting anything started. You know, you got the three ring binder that says the software development life cycle on it, the SDLC. There's committees, there's stage gates, there's reviews, there's budget approvals, there's, there's meetings, endless meetings, there's sign offs that have to be had by people who never show up at the meetings. Organizations will not tolerate, at least successful ones, at least ones that stay profitable, will not tolerate not getting anything done. And then you end up with shadow organizations forming. Usually somewhere about this time, if you actually had an SDLC, a software development lifecycle document and procedure and committee, there might even be a PMO, a project management office, that's the project management police for such efforts. Usually somewhere in the midst of that, somebody says, oh, we need an SDLC light. We, we need a lighter version of this. It's not, no longer a three ring binder, it's just a little stapled together document. But even when those meetings fail to get scheduled and the sign offs fail to occur, and the PMO gets fired and disqualified and canceled and sent out the building, then one day the organization declares, oh yeah, we're agile now. <laughs> and then we're right back to chaos, aren't we? I once gave that description to a large corporation. They said, Rich, you've just described the last four years of my life, this pendulum swinging back and forth between chaos and bureaucracy. And unfortunately, for many of us in the industry, we end up burying the projects we're working on in the backyard before they ever see the light of day. And quite frankly, part of this for me goes to the joy that was missing in my life. Because you see, the work of engineers, people who don't understand the engineering mindset, think we just like to do engineering. No, we don't. We like to delight people. That's why we do what we do. We want to see the work of our hands and our minds. We want it to get out into the world. We want it to be widely adopted. We want, it to, we want somebody who doesn't know what we know to stop us on the sidewalk and maybe thinking in their head that what we did was just a little magical. Say, really? You guys did that? That's awesome. That must be so much fun. I love what you guys did. You made my life better. When we drop the team into that disillusionment of burying the projects in the backyard before they see the light of day, we have to start giving them raises and you know, telling them they did a great job and all that sort of thing. And they're like, no, I just wanted to see my work get out into the world. So in the midst of all this turmoil, in the midst of all this chaos that was going on in my life as I climbed a ladder from programmer in my earliest days to vice president of R&D at a tired old public company in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I was contemplating, as the video said, getting out. I didn't want to be in this chaos anymore. There was only some very real practical problems for me in my life. Well, I shouldn't call them that. I mean, I'm talking about my wife and my children and my house and cars and that sort of thing. Things that I had to pay for. Things that were expensive three daughters. I was stuck. I was stuck in a career I didn't want to be in. I was in my late 30s and early 40s, and I looked out ahead of course in my career, and I thought, oh my gosh, I've got another 25 years at least to go, and I'm stuck in a job I hate. I don't want to be here anymore. So I began reading books during this 
part of my life. I read a lot of books. I, I am actually wired to be an eternal optimist. If you put me in a room full of manure, I will keep digging till I find the pony. And I knew there was one in here somewhere. And that was the time and back in 1999 where I had this click moment, like Franz Johansson likes to describe in the book of that name, where all that preparation, all that pain, all that thinking, all that consternation actually revealed itself in a moment to me. I read a book by Kent Beck called Extreme Programming Explained. It's fun to be out here in Portland knowing just a, maybe a couple hundred miles from where his farm is. And then I saw an industrial design firm highlighted in Nightline called IDEO. And they showed a redesign the shopping cart in just five days segment on Nightline with Ted Koppel. And in that moment, boom, it happened. I knew where I was going. I knew what I was going to do. I was a vice president, so I had some, I had some <clears throat> authority to make some big changes. And so I did. And I pulled the team out of their old offices and cubes, and I put them out in a big open room and changed the paths in the carpet. And I can tell you the first reaction of that team when I suggested we were going to do this was rich blood, mayhem, murder. But that was OK. I didn't care anymore because I wasn't running towards risk. I was running away from risk. Because what was at risk was me. What was at risk was my love for my profession. And I was determined to get out of that quagmire. And I was going to drag a whole bunch of other people with me. Now, I think I did it pretty well. And I think I did it with compassion and energy and leadership and vision. But it was still hard. It was still really difficult. And I had to surround myself with some partners to help me get there. And then I got two years to build this awesome experiment. And then in 2001, all taken away from me when the bubble burst. A California company that bought my company shuttered every remote office they had. And I was pushed out onto the street like hundreds of thousands of others. And that was the moment that Menlo came to existence. So the question I will pose to you now is, if joy matters, can you see it? Can you feel it? Can you touch it? Is it tangible? And is it profitable? Or is this a zero-sum game? Do we get more joy if we get less business results? And I will offer up the hypothesis in my presentation with you today that this is anything but a zero-sum game. In fact, I will even offer up the opposite that until you remember why you're in this profession and why the business you're in is in this industry, until you get back to that thing that Simon Sinek calls the start with why moment for you and for your company, you will languish in process and in bureaucracy and in chaos and poor results and that sort of thing. People do come from around the plant to see us. We count the tours every year. We did 340 tours last year for almost 2,500 people, they come from around the planet to peek in, to see. We embrace this. We're doing more than a tour a day now. <clears throat> the first thing people see is what's not in the room. This vilified open office environment that I read articles about now. Maybe you've read these same articles I have, the ones that say that this kind of office environment, the one with no walls or cubes or offices or doors, is an idea born in the mind of Satan in the deepest caverns of hell. That was a quote from a Fast Company magazine just recently. And it's interesting, because when those articles get written, and there's a lot of people who know about Menlo because they've come and visited, or they've read the book, and they send me these articles, and they say, Rich, see, it doesn't work. This crazy open office environment, it doesn't work. They've got psychologists that tell you why. They, 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 these are introverts. My god, you can't have introverts working in an environment like this. They have data. It proves it doesn't work. And then they say, why does it work at Menlo? And I had to think about that. I actually, the, the, the people out in the world demanded that I answer this question. They made me write a blog post on it. And I, thought about it, and I thought, oh, I get it now. You see, we didn't build an open and collaborative workspace. We built an open and collaborative culture, and then we fit our workspace to our culture. I think that's the difference that a lot of people take with many of these kind of approaches that you're contemplating, or perhaps you're already doing, 
is we do them because the book tells us to do them. We do them because we think that we, if we just follow, actually it's fun that um, Zach put up a, a Richard Feynman uh, uh, video there. He's also one of my favorite uh, storytellers and he tells a story of what he called cargo cult science. He talked about the islands out in Indonesia where natives saw the economies flourish when the airplanes would come and drop off supplies and after the war ended all their economies tanked and they so they built airstrips but they didn't have airplanes so they built things that looked like airplanes they didn't have towers anymore so they took little sticks and built towers and they didn't have headphones anymore so they put coconuts on their ears with little sticks sticking up and they said this is what was going on when our economy was flourishing and if we copy it then our economy will flourish again and of course it didn't and I think a lot of people who move to any kind of process change often fall into the trap of cargo cult science. We didn't. We built the workspace that worked for the culture we were planning. We embrace noise. This is unusual for our industry. Our industry believes that software development, for example, should be done in the library quiet. You know, I, I often get invited into organizations. They want to show me their team. They walk me through the, the team room. They, they, the conversation goes something like this, Rich, this is where our technical team works. They're thinking really deep thoughts right now. And we walk through the sea of darkened cubicles and everybody's got earbuds in their ears and are silently clicking away on keyboards. And they get over to the corner office and she closes the door and says, now, I want to talk to you about some of our communication challenges here. Like, really? <laughs> Do you think it's because nobody's talking to one another? Oh, no, we've installed all the latest in electronic communication. Like, really? They have to communicate electronically when they sit right next to one another? We throw up barriers to human communication all the time in our organizations, and that's not how humans work well. In our environment, we embrace noise. There's a very few rules at Menlo. One of them is you can't have earbuds in your ears. It's actually not allowed. We want you to overhear things. It actually harkens back to the namesake place that we, uh, that we uh, admire, and that's the Menlo Park, New Jersey lab of Thomas Edison. Small room of energized individuals that created some of the most unbelievable changes, innovative changes in the history of mankind. You can actually see the teamwork in the room. Saw it in the video. Here you see a picture of it. The team has full control of the space, as you'll learn. They form the space however they choose. We made it such that it's easy for them to change the space. And for all the years of our existence, we've been around since 2001, the team has chosen to put the, these small five foot by two and a half foot aluminum tables side to side, front to front. This is how close they want to be to one another. There are no rules that tell them this is how they have to organize the space. Space is very flexible, it's very visual. Pull downs from the ceiling, lightweight aluminum tables, Every one of these pillars that holds up seven floors of parking structure above us wired so the team can put the tables wherever they choose and the space changes all the time. It doesn't just change a little bit and there's no facilities people to ask, there's no permission to be granted, there's no space police to watch what you're doing, the team just changes the space and oh by the way, I sit right out in the room with everybody else, I'm the co-founder, the CEO of the company and I sit out in the room with everybody else, and quite frankly, I don't even choose where I sit. I go where the team puts me. I could go back tomorrow, find out they moved my table, and I'll just go sit wherever they put me. And in the heart of all this, the heart of our operating system is a learning organization. A learning organization is described by Peter Senge in the fifth discipline. And of course, a learning uh, system probably includes authors and books, and this has been very important for me personally. We make them ubiquitous to the team, but this isn't the heart of our operating system. The heart of our learning system is how we organize the people in the space. You see, we do this pairing thing not just our programmers, but everybody pairs in our team. We put those two heads together, those two hearts together, so that they get the energy of supporting one another and feeling safe with one another. They put their four hands together at a single computer and they do the work together. In our world, our pairs are assigned. We don't let them self-select and we switch them every five working days. It has knowledge racing around the room. You can ask me questions about that. I'm going to leave plenty of time for questions at the end. 
And at the base level of all of this is a culture that hates meetings. We think meetings are mind-numbing, spirit-sucking, energy-draining devices of management. You can ask me later how I really feel about them. How do I know this is true? Go watch your next meeting. See what happens when the people gather in the conference room. How long does it take before the electronics come out? Before the people in the room disengage? Before they're actually voting with their electronics to say, I don't want to be here. I have more important things to do. In our world, we replace them. We replace them with active conversations. We replace them with rituals that I'll show you a few of. Rituals supported by artifacts. And I love this quote. This is one of the books I read in my trough of disillusionment period back in the 80s. John Naisbitt wrote a book, Megatrends. I'm stunned to think now how prescient he was when he wrote this. This is 30 years ago now. That the most exciting breakthroughs of the 21st century will not occur because of technology, but because of an expanding concept of what it means to be human. I think we're at that point right now. We all feel it, right? How many of us are checking email the minute we get up in the morning and the last thing we do before we go to bed at night? How many of us are packing up laptops with properly configured VPNs just before we head off to vacation? In our space, we support it with this wide open space and we don't have meetings. And so what we do is we, um, we use, when we communicate with one another, we don't use electronics. We use what we like to call high-speed voice technology. It's awesome, the hardware's built right in. Vocal cords, tympanic membranes, auditory nerve stimulation of the brain. If I wanna call a meeting with somebody, I'll say, hey, Jorgen. Yep, there we are, we're in a meeting. Uh, if I wanna call an all-company meeting, I just say, hey, Menlo, everybody says, hey, Rich, and boom, the whole place goes silent, we're in an all-company meeting. No CC all email, no book the conference room, no 15-minute meeting dance of everybody peeking in to see if enough people are there, and I'll go get a cup of coffee, I'll go check one more email, I'll go talk to somebody down the hall. We do have one meeting. We uh, acknowledge that there is some value in getting everybody together. It's called by a dartboard. The dartboard has an alarm in it. Why the dartboard has an alarm in it, I have no idea, but we set it to go off at 10 o'clock and bong, bong, bong in the room. Everybody stands up, they gather in a circle. I do mean everybody. We pass around the iconic symbol of Menlo, the plastic Viking helmet. The reason we like the plastic Viking helmet is very practical. We work in pairs, we report out in pairs. It's nice to have a two-handle token, so we grab the plastic Viking helmet, and here's Tracy and Joe reporting out. Here's Katie and Nate reporting out, Thomas and Carol. Goes around the circle, 50, 60 people in the meeting any given day. The meeting starts, is held, everyone reports out, completes, get back to work, 13 minutes. I defy most organizations to begin a meeting of 60 people in 13 minutes, let alone get all that other stuff done. I want to talk a few minutes about the tribes of technology because there's three distinct ones we focus our attention on. There's the technical tribe, probably the one that most of us belong to. We speak our own language, we have our own culture, we've gotten our own backgrounds, and as we come together, we, we have our own lingo. We can use a lot of shorthand with one another, it usually comes in the form of TLAs. But there's another tribe who pays us for the work that we do the business tribe, the people who fund what we do, fund product development, or in our case, because we're a software design and development firm, we build software and design it on contract with other firms. Our funders, our, our clients who pay us to do the work that we do. The way we engage that tribe is very important. The conversations that support that in our world occur in a weekly show and tell with our client. This is an example of a show and tell. This is another example. And the way we do this is we reverse the roles from what you might think in a show and tell because we want to engage the client. The way we engage our stakeholders, our champions, however you might mention them, your product sponsors, your product owners, anything like that, the way we engage the other tribe matters. It matters a lot. So here what we do is we actually reverse the traditional role. The gentleman in the blue shirt sitting at the computer is not one of our people, it's our client. 
You see, our client comes in every five working days, sits down with us, and shows us the work we did the previous five days. We don't show it to him, he shows it to us. Reverses the role, pulls him right into the conversation. He can't sit there and just sprinkle corporate holy water on our work. He's gotta to touch the work that we did. While my team watches, all the people sitting around him are the people who did that work for the previous five days. We don't inject a person between the client and the team. We don't have someone who has to come back and do a managerial interpretive dance after this discussion with the client to tell us what, what happened. Were they excited? Were they enthused? Were they concerned? The team is gonna feel all those emotions right there. In fact, Eric, who's standing here in the middle of the room, is one of the guys who worked on what's up on the screen and he's explaining to the client or answering questions. It's a very active discussion, it's a conversation, it's a ritual. We know exactly how to walk through that. The other way we engage this business tribe is with very simple tools. We use simple paper-based artifacts to do planning. We don't use electronics, again, we don't use electronics. In fact, I brought some of our planning artifacts here. I just thought I'd show you some of the elements of it. This is how we do planning. We write the story cards. As you'll find out in a second, they're handwritten. We estimate them, and then we fold them to the size of the estimate. So this is a 32-hour card, and you'll notice the spatial relationship, 32 to 16 and 8. Do you get the system? Is this making sense? Folded to the size of the card, and then the client comes in and picks up these little folded pieces of paper and lays them down on a planning sheet, then it can accommodate 40 hours worth of work, and 32 hours of that can be story carded activity. There's some other things we have to do, and you can see, again, client picks up this piece of paper, lays it down on the planning sheet, and they've consumed two of my people for a week and the budget that that represents. And again, this is the client doing this. They pick up these little pieces of paper, they lay them down on the planning sheets, and that authorizes us to do work. And this simple paper-based management system eliminates an incredible amount of ambiguity. Most project management systems do a decent job of telling you what's in the plan. Almost none of them indicate what you've decided not to do. Think about that the next time you have a meeting. Pull people aside after the meeting and say, what did we decide not to do in the meeting? See what people say. They'll look at you, some of them will look at you funny and they're like, what do you mean? Is that what the purpose of the meeting was? Here, if the cards sit on the table, they don't get put on the planning sheet, they're not in the plan. The client specifically decided not to do them. Very, very simple. Someone looked at this system and also how we do work authorization and status reporting, and they said, Rich, you're like the Amish of software development. <laughs> I once had the, a lady from Microsoft in to visit with us, and she looked at this, and I said, I gotta know. Does the team who use Microsoft Project, or is the team that build Microsoft Project at Microsoft actually use Microsoft Project to manage the project that's the building of Microsoft Project? You know where I'm headed with this, right? <laughs> She laughed. She said, Rich, nobody at Microsoft uses Microsoft Project. Uh, <laughs> it's a very engaging discussion between our team and our customer. It's active, it's involved, it's engaging, it's energizing, and it feels safe because everybody doesn't get confused by the tools along the way. Our clients are very invested in this. It's a collaborative effort. It's a great place to teach the team about what we do, and it's supported by these simple paper-based cards that we write. We hand-write them. We put them on five and a half inch by eight and a half inch index cards, and this is very important for us. We hand-write them because it engages a different part of your brain. Cutting and pasting doesn't engage the same part of your brain. We write them on small, simple cards because these small, simple cards force us well, you remember the old adage, right? I was gonna write you a long letter, but I didn't have time. Or I was gonna write you a short letter, but I didn't have time, so I wrote you a long one. This forces you to make it concise, to get to the point, not put eight pages worth of things in a story card. Once the work is selected by our clients, it's put up on a big wall like this. Again, this gets us named the Amish of software development, or a lot of people look at this and say, oh, this is the Toyota production system, even though we've never been to Toyota until recently. 
The cards are placed in the pairings, so everybody's assigned work. Each column is a pair of people assigned to do several cards worth of work, never more than 40 hours per week. See, we have kind of a weird culture in that regard, too. I think it goes to joy. We work 40 hours of work a week. We never work weekends. And in 13 years now, we've never had a deny or delay a vacation request. And when you go on vacation, you don't bring a laptop. You're actually forbidden from checking work email when you're on vacation. We want you to enjoy your time away. We use these color-coded sticky dots to indicate the status of every card up in the wall. A yellow dot says that's what you're working on right now. An orange dot says you think you're done. Any programmers in the room? My guys. So programmers have as many different definitions for done as Eskimos have words for snow. You've probably heard many of them. Maybe you've uttered some of them. If you are a programmer, I certainly did. Well, it's done, but it's not done done. Yeah, it worked on my machine. Any QA people in the room? Any QA people? Oh, there we go. You ever hear a programmer tell you it worked on their machine? Yeah. OK, I got a response for you now. If you get nothing else out of this conference, this is the one you take home with you. As soon as the programmer says that, say, great, we're shipping your machine tomorrow. They'll be like, no, it's my machine. I'll help you get it working on one more. Yeah, excellent, good. Other than that, they look at you like, huh, it worked on my machine. I don't know, that's your problem, your QA. In our world, our programmers can only self-declare they think they're done. They put the orange dot on the card, and that's a call to QA to come and check their work nearly on the heels within minutes, hours, maybe days, but nothing longer than that. QA checks their work. If QA doesn't like what they see, red dot. That's an endorphin rush for the QA team, by the way. QA loves to break things. Why does QA like to break things? Because QA wants to find the problems here and now not once it's out in the field. That's joy for them. If they can prevent the errors from occurring when they're out there in the world, am I right? That's what drives them. If QA likes what they see, you get a green dot. QA signs off on it saying, this is what we did. Green dot is endorphin rush for the programmers. And I think this is one of the elements of our joyful culture is the ability to get to that green dot says you actually got something done. I think this is the most engaging part of any organization is the ability to go to work and get meaningful things done. Most of us go to work and we do a lot of stuff and we're really busy and we work really long days and we're frenzied and harried and we get home and our loved one looks at us and says, wow, you look really tired, honey. Did you have a hard day? Did you get a lot done? And you're like, uh, <laughs> I did a lot of stuff, got nothing done, spent a lot of time in meetings. This slide cuts to joy. This slide is all about the thing we really want to do at Menlo the thing that really binds us together as a team and is the heart of our shared belief system. We believe it is possible at Menlo and in the world in general to design technology that works for humans. We believe it is possible to delight the humans who are going to use software and technology who don't know what we know but are experts at what they know. And the only way to get to this, and you probably have heard this many times by this point, is to go out into the world and find the people who are going to use the technology you're going to use. I just read a New York Times article about Dr. Genevieve Bell at your corporation, who's an anthropologist. This is what we do. We have a set of people on our team. They call them high-tech anthropologists. Their job, study people, study them in their native environment, go out into the world, learn their vocabulary, their habits, their goals as human beings, bring that back discover the invisible things that they would never think to tell you, and then ultimately pull all of that right down to a pixel-perfect screen design that our programmers then turn into working software. This goes to the heart of joy for us, how we define joy. We want to see the work that happens in our room get out into the world, be widely adopted and delightfully used. They use a lot of tools like personas and persona maps, and this all focuses our attention on making sure we're not building it for ourselves, that we don't say things like, oh, I think it'd be really cool if it worked like this. It's like, great, you're not a diesel motor mechanic. Why would we build it for you? They use a lot of sense-making tools. 3M probably loves us to death. <clears throat> and now I want to just finish with a story. And you're going to think it's a story about dogs and babies. And it's a story that includes dogs and babies, but it's not a story about dogs and babies. It's perhaps something I can light inside of you, a phrase that you can take home with you, take, take back to work with you the next day you're back in the office doing what you normally do. But I'm going to characterize it inside of a story. 
Seven years ago, Tracy, one of our key leaders on the team, had a baby. Little Maggie was born. Tracy was away for three months on paid maternity leave. She came back after three months, came up to me and said, Rich, I'm ready to come back to work. I said, great, we can't wait to have you. She said, there's just one problem. I said, what's that? She says, Maggie's only three months old. She's too young for daycare. Now in that moment, something happened in my brain. In that moment, there was a screaming match that Tracy never heard, and it was two voices sitting on each of my shoulders. The first one said, don't you dare. HR will kill you. You can't do that. That's against the rules. There's probably laws against this. The liability you're incurring would be huge. The other one said, you're an entrepreneur. It's your company. You don't even have an HR department. <laughs> Tell her it's OK. So I looked at Tracy. I said, bring her in. She looked at me funny. She says, what do you mean? I said, bring her into the office. She said, all day? I said, sure. She said, every day? I said, why not? And then she looked around that big open room and she said, Rich, where will I put her? I said, she's not going anywhere, she's three months old. Put her in a bassinet on the floor or wherever you're working. She says, yeah, but what if she makes a fuss? I said, here? It's like a noisy restaurant, you'll never hear it. She goes, yeah, but what if she really makes a fuss? I said, Tracy, you're the mom. You'll do the right thing, I trust you, we'll work it out together. Now, you might think this is a picture of Maggie, it is not. This is Ellie. This is Menlo baby number eight in the last seven years. This is Greg holding Ellie while he's pair programming. This is mom, Katie, holding Ellie while doing high-tech anthropology with our team. This is Tracy with Solomon, Menlo baby number seven, who's a little bit more grown up now, doesn't come in every day, but comes in to visit every now and then. This is Fern, the dog, kind of our receptionist. And here's the thing about the experiment we ran. Things worked differently than we expected. It's kind of what happens, right? We heard Zach talk about that in his presentation. What was different? Number one, when Maggie fussed in those early days, it was seldom mom had to go rescue the baby. The team was like, no, no, it's my turn to go get the baby. <laughs> and the team, they got pictures of me sitting in my computer. I could do email with one hand while holding baby with the other. We do a lot of tours, I lead many of them. I can tell you if you put a baby on my chest while I'm leading a tour with this deep booming voice, the baby just conks out. And then we discovered something really magical. Customers behave better when you bring a baby to the meeting. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> they're like, oh, this is so cool. You guys are amazing. I love the way you think. And then they're like, can I hold the baby? And we love the customers holding the baby. And then, and boy, is that joy or what? Uh, this is Henry going around. He's learned some ways of management. Hey, get your TPS report ready. <laughs> you coming to the meeting? Are you staying this weekend? How's it going? What you working on? Uh, I think actually somebody told me Henry was looking for the dog. And then something else happened along the way. We do embrace babies at Menlo. We also embrace dogs at Menlo. And then one day, the gentleman in the orange shirt, who's a client of Menlo, called up before his show and tell, his weekly show and tell, here with Megan and Laura. And he said, hey, uh, is it okay if I bring Buster with me to the show and tell? We're like, sure, who's Buster? He says, my, my Great Dane. Really, you wanna bring your Great Dane to a client meeting? Sure. And so, you know, <laughs> dogs, you know, puts his feet up here, his head would be here on me. Um, <clears throat> And I thought, what a magical moment when your customer gets involved enough, when your stakeholder gets involved enough, when your champion gets involved enough in your culture that they begin participating. And I offer up these stories again because they're fun, they're intriguing, probably there's some elements of this that maybe would work here and maybe some elements that wouldn't, I don't know. But the idea isn't about the dogs and the babies. It's about run the experiment. You see, you heard all the things. Tracy was the mom. She probably was delighted at the idea of bringing Maggie into work, but she, what did she do? She threw up barrier after barrier after barrier after barrier, and I had to knock every one of them down. Think how many things you guys talk about in your organization where you say, oh, yeah, we tried that, never worked. Oh, that other place I used to work, we tried that. Oh, I've read books, that won't work here. Run the damn experiment. See what works. If it works, great, keep going. If it doesn't, don't just stop, adjust. This is what we do as humans. 
My favorite story, we teach all of this stuff to others. We have classes in our process. And there was a day where uh, there was a class coming through from AAA Life Insurance. I tell this story in the book. And a team was coming in, 25 people at a time from their IT team from an insurance company. And they, they were like, they were pissed. I mean, they were just upset. And the third group of 25, they were coming through a full full day class. And I could tell by 10 o'clock that morning, this was not going to be a happy day for me as their instructor, because I could just see the vitriol in their eyes. And finally, I just stopped the class. I said, guys, what's going on here? I don't get it. And they're like, we don't know why our management is sending us to these classes. I said, what do you mean? They said, well, they'd never let us work like you guys do. Why are they sending us here? I said, OK. Why are they sending you here? They said, yeah, we don't know. I said, well, go ask them. They're like, oh, we know what they'd say. I'm like, really? I said, go ask them. They said, well, what, was she, what, would she, what should we ask them? I said, tell you what, tell your management team they have to come here and take the same class. Oh, they would never do that. I said, go. I said, OK, finally, I just raised my hand. I said, I'm the lightning rod. Blame me. They will not understand your enthusiasm. You go back to the office tomorrow. You go up to the CEO's office. You storm the castle wall, and you tell them, Rich Sheridan said, you got to go take a class for eight hours at Menlo. And they're like, they would never do that. I said, no. You go tell them, I told you to tell them this. Two weeks later, I had the entire executive team at AAA Life Insurance in our office. CEO, CFO, VP, marketing head of HR, sales, the whole shot, the entire executive team. They spent the entire eight hours with me. And at the end of the day, they said, this is awesome, but our technical team would never go for this. <laughs> think about it. How many barriers do we put up in our organizations that we think are there? They're really not. And in and amongst all of this, we have to do good work. There has to be rigor and discipline behind what we do. We have to believe so strongly in what we do that we believe strongly that we want to do a good job. And ultimately, I think this is where we're really at as a society. I think we've been there a long time. Peter Singer wrote this book probably back in the late 80s, early 90s. In the long run, the only sustainable competitive advantage in your organization is that part of your organization where you can learn faster than your competition. And clearly, Intel has been doing that for a long, long time. So you guys should be very proud of everything you've accomplished here. I'm happy to take questions now. I won't be able to see your hands necessarily, but uh, and I don't even know what time it is. If there's a clock in the room, let me know. Hello, Rich. Thank you for the great presentation Thank here. Thank you. Um, when you do the pairings of the employees, are they the same job function, or are they complementary job functions? Typically, um, they're birds of a feather. So programmers pair with programmers, and QA with QA, and high-tech anthropologists with high-tech anthropologists, project manager with project manager. Uh, there are times where cross-functional pair is valuable, and we'll just do that. But uh, that falls into the realm of experimentation. Okay. Thanks. You bet. Hi. Uh, do you find that everyone you hire adapts to the way that uh, <laughs> you expect them to work? Or do you find do you hire people that, that just can't fit in? Yeah. Uh, so um, I'm going to just back up a little bit from your question, because it speaks to something very important, and that is, if you're going to be as intentional about your culture as we are, you better take a hard look at how you recruit, how you interview, how you hire, how you onboard, how you evaluate, how you move people up in your organization, what things, what behaviors to reward, and that sort of thing. So absolutely, Menlo is not the right place for everybody. Uh, and uh, we have a whole different kind of system for doing all the other things I talked about. In fact, today, uh, interestingly enough, I won't be there for it and I'll miss it, uh, we're running an extreme interview at Menlo. And what that means is we bring a group of people, I think there's about 30 coming in mass. In this particular case, all we need is programmers. So we're bringing in 30 programmers into Menlo all at the same time. And we do a mass interview. We, and what we do is we pair the programmers who are interviewing together to do a 20-minute exercise on a piece of paper with a pencil, a simple exercise, not like how many golf balls does it take to fill up this auditorium, nothing stupid. Uh, this is practical things. We do this for 20 minutes, and we tell the people we're watching the first interview. We don't care anything. We'll give a hoot about your resume, your background, where you went to school, what you, amazing things you've done, what degrees you've earned. All we're caring about is, what did Mrs. Kleinschmidt teach you when you were six in kindergarten? or four, however little kids are when they go to kindergarten. We're looking for your kindergarten skills. Do you play well with others? We do three 20-minute exercises 
to check for kindergarten skills because you can imagine how important that is in that big open room. And we give people the success criteria. It's not a secret. Uh, we tell them don't grab the pencil out of the other person's hand. If you, if you think she's struggling, help her out. Your job is to try and get her a second interview. That's how we, we, this is like improv theater at its best. In improv theater, when people step onto the stage, the thought that should be in their mind is, I am the least important person here. My job is to make everybody else on the stage look good. That's what we're interviewing for. So we build our cultural training and our filtering process right into our interview process. I could go on and on about what, where it goes from there. And it doesn't always work out. Even if we think we got a good candidate, we have to be able to send people on their way if they don't fit our culture. And I will say that's an important part of building a strong culture, is know who fits and who doesn't, and give people time to adapt to the change. Because even if they think they want to work here, it's going to take time to adjust. It just is, because it's very different than the way most people work. One thing I will say, though, I state too, because it's always surprising to people, Menlo is filled with introverts. It could not work with extroverts. And what introverts prefer is not lonely, quiet, sensory deprivation chambers. They actually prefer fewer, deeper, safer relationships, and they get that here. Thank you very much. Thank you.